Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown. And today we are heading to BC to continue our municipal series where we sit down with local elected leaders from across Canada to talk to them about themselves, their community, and of course, their duty to serve. Today, we are sitting down with the District of Clearwater Mayor, Marilyn Blackwell. He has graciously accepted a spot on the show to talk about himself. Uh, welcome to the show, Mayor Blackwell. Uh, thanks for having me, Chris. This is awesome. So, Mayor Blackwell, I'm going to start with the very first question everyone gets, and you're no exception. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, you know, it's a roundabout question. I actually got into politics um, as sort of a defense mechanism when I was uh, working as a government contractor to uh, the province of BC. So initially it was to sort of uh, find out how government worked and then uh, protect myself and give myself a little bit of access to uh, different channels of government. Um, but over time, obviously, it, it has evolved into serving people. And uh, I really like to solve problems and I really like to solve problems for, for people. I, I take great joy in that. Um, and that's pretty much where that duty to serve comes from. Nobody in my family is in politics. Uh, very few people within my family and friends group of the past um, were involved in, in community service in any sort of way. So it sort of evolved over time. Was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up or are you sort of like the black sheep of the family and politics came to you at one day just randomly? Um, politics definitely was. I mean, I have a weird sort of, I call it random access memory. I remember things from back when I was, a, you know, a small kid, uh, 50, you know, ish years ago. Uh, polit political incidents, um, uh, Nixon leaving the White House in the helicopter. I remember that scene in my mind from when it happened. I, I, I remember, you know, various other political incidents through time, Ronald Reagan uh, assassination attempt, things like that. But also uh, discussion in high school about the before free trade occurred, um, what that meant to Canada and the, and the form of resource management and water rights and things like that. Um, so I've always had sort of that interest in politics and, and um, the strategy behind it and, and how sometimes politics does not follow logic. It's more about um, getting things done through whatever means possible versus, you know, just setting, sitting down and, and creating a plan and moving forward, um, which is how business generally does things. In your speech there, you talked about federal issues, uh, international issues. But I didn't hear municipal issues. What was the draw to municipal government in general, particularly local government? So this gets back to Clearwater and my town itself. Um, Clearwater is now only about 15 years old as a municipality. We're very freshly squeezed on this. We're, we're As we refer to it locally, we're in our teenage years. So when I moved to Clearwater um, to live full time a little over 20 years ago after working here for the last 30 years uh, on and off, um, one of the things that that really hit me is it was a fairly large town. It had 2,400 people locally, but it was part and managed through a, a regional district. Um, so it had no local political direction in the sense that most municipalities have. It had a representative on a larger regional board, but it wasn't deciding its own destiny. So early on in my time here, um, I decided to get involved in the Chamber of Commerce because I saw that as a form of uh, promoting local um, decision making. Um, but after several failed referendums for incorporation, um, finally one stuck here in Clearwater and I'd done a lot of letter writing saying you really need to determine your own future here in town. Um, so after sort of the first term of council, I didn't run for that one because I was just still involved in the Chamber of Commerce. But essentially, the second term of council on, um, I got involved in local par politics because I really was uh, interested in building a municipality from the ground up and being part of that sort of growth in a place that I saw so much potential in as far as tourism and forest sector and, and other types of things that really weren't developed or taken advantage uh, of before incorporation and the way that you can do uh, through incorporation and, and your ability to uh, receive grants and have conversations with the provincial government about the things that you need um, without being sort of a ward of the provincial government or a larger rural district. 
So in 2011, because I've done my research just to make sure, uh-huh. in 2011 is the first election that you stand for, correct? Like you yes. hadn't stand yes. provincially or federal. Um, what was the main issue in 2011 that you want? You talk about the growth and you wanted to see it move forward, but was there a specific issue that you said, okay, I need to be on council because I believe my voice is going to be able to address issue X and issue X needs to be addressed from what I believe to grow the district of Clearwater. Yeah, yeah, for sure there was. Um, these days it's healthcare. I spent a lot of time talking about healthcare. Back then, it was um, tourism. Uh, my background, uh, the company that I ran, bef- well, I got into politics and until actually uh, just uh, getting into being mayor, I just sold it off recently, was running Wells Gray Provincial Park for the provincial government. Um, so before that, uh, since I think about the age of 11 or 12, I'd worked in the ca- the family parks management slash tourism business running private and uh, provincial campgrounds. So Clearwater is in an interesting place in the world. It is between Jasper and Vancouver, um, but it's part of a very large tourism route for uh, especially European foreign tourists driving rental motorhomes. Uh, We're on a route that sees 2 million people travel through it a day. In the early days through my own research with my company, I realized that we were scraping off maybe 10% of those people to visit local attractions, even though they were driving on the highway right through our town every single day. That was one of the biggest things. I saw an opportunity there economically for a town um, that wasn't seeing the value of tourism and had a, you know, we, we could kind of see the writing on the wall when it comes to forest industry, that there was going to be a slow decline on for in forest industry. Spent a lot of time uh, talking to people about that one over the years. So beefing up our role in tourism was a huge factor for me getting involved in, in local politics, but also you need to build the infrastructure, um, the pipes, the roads, the back then even we had incredibly poor internet connections uh, service cellular things like that uh, cellular service uh, didn't show up in this town till about 2005 well beyond when it showed up in a lot of places in Canada because of the geography the mountains and things like that and the low levels of population so having that access to say to government to large corporations hey we're here there is a business case for this that was a lot of the reason why I got into local politics, to put the infrastructure in place that would help grow this community to its full potential, uh, and, and in, a, in a sense, help protect itself from being a one-horse resource town and, and bring it into sort of a more balanced economic town. I'm looking forward to our discussion about tourism a little bit later in the conversation because with your background in tourism, but I want to stick mm-hmm. to you for a few seconds here. Um, in 2011, your name appears on the ballot. Uh, take me mm-hmm. through that moment you walk in the ballot box and you put an X beside your name for the first time. You never forget your first time when you get to vote for yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely terrifying, to be honest. <laughs> um uh, you know, I, I've got my three terms and and a bit here now under the belt. I sit on, on uh, UBCM board, um, three other boards beyond the District of Clearwater. I am out there in the world, but back then I was definitely an introvert. I, I call myself now an extroverted introvert. It requires a lot of mental preparation to go out there and be public all the time. And back then... Um, before I, I got sort of used to being in the public eye, it was a terrifying experience. Um, I really did not know what I was getting into. Like a lot of people that I talked to in this business, I didn't even realize I was getting a paycheck for this. Uh, you know, it's not much of a paycheck, but I, I want to know this is another volunteer thing. This is another chamber of commerce or, or, or something along those lines. I had no idea the time commitment. For the first few months, people had to remind me that I needed to attend uh, meetings. So, yeah, the learning curve uh, to where I am now has been uh, pretty much, still pretty much straight up, but here we are. Have you found the balance, though? Have you found the balance between public life and private life? Because as an introvert extrovert, as you've so eloquently said, I can yes. imagine it's hard to want to be the mayor, but also want to be Merlin, just the random guy who sits at home and watches TV from time to time or goes out and grabs groceries. Yeah, it is for sure. Uh, I think every small town uh, politician finds that balance, but especially if you're not the person that that craves that, uh, that that constant um, 
conversation at, at the getting the 20 to 30 minutes to to get a jug of milk at the grocery store that's not everybody's favorite thing to do and, and as as primarily an interviewer I, I make it through those things i have those conversations but they're not always as enjoyable as i think extroverts would find um yeah and, and i do actually need the downtime away from this to do that so that work life balance is very hard especially the more involved you get into this um, and and definitely in the last year, advocating for healthcare and before that for forest industry change, we we lost our primary industry here about six months uh, after I got elected. Our mill closed down, so there's that transition, and then we went into COVID and wildfire season. So um, it's been an interesting ride as my first term as mayor because I, I there was no time to not be in the spotlight or not. Hide, to, to be able to hide from things and recover because we were in basically a constant um, state of challenge from six months in till basically now um, with various uh, things happening locally and in the world. Um, yes, uh, I spent a lot of time crawling in the basement, hiding under a rock when I'm not being mayor just to recover from being mayor uh, for sure. So how does a counselor become mayor because you seem like a very personal guy you seem like a very outgoing guy but it sounds like you did don't crave the spotlight but as mayor you are in the spotlight 24 7 you're even more in the spotlight than you are as the counselor because you are the voice and you are the spokesperson for your town so in 20 uh, i just want to make sure 2018 when you first ran for mayor what was the decision behind that? Was it just the former mayor was retiring and they were looking for someone on council? Or did you think that you would be best to grow those ideas that you talked about earlier on in the episode already? It was a few things. Um, primarily, it was exactly what you suggest there, which was the last mayor was retiring out. John Harwood had been the only mayor Clearwater had known up to this point. Uh, he had been there for the bed work a bedrock work of building this town um, as as a mayor. He assured me uh, when he brought me into his office and said, you know, I, I really think you're probably the, the best, most rounded, fair leader on the table. Uh, I think you should consider doing this, um, that I would only be doing, you know, 12 to 16 hours a week. That was a very creative lie. Um, <laughs> Circumstances of the world have been part of the problem there. You uh, throw a you know pandemic, everything else that I mentioned into there. Um, but for me, it was also a breaking point in my life where I had to decide whether I wanted to keep doing um, this very large, involved, complicated government contract uh, with a business, uh, or to do politics. And and you know I, you know, took a pretty healthy pay cut, but I decided that I'd like to do. I don't know why something less stressful in my life being the mayor of Clearwater versus running a, uh, a business that was spread over 5,000 square kilometers with 21 employees and 70 some odd pieces of equipment that were failing on a regular basis, hurting tourists in a climate change environment with the constant risk of uh, wildfire and uh, and weather cyclic events that were, were shutting down that business at a rate there. I could really see, um, you know, losing that business just to um, climate change and, and the effects of the world on that. So I had a choice to make between, you know, what I thought at the time was the very stressful, very profitable um, business or the less stressful, really nice, what am I going to do with my life for a few years till I decide the next thing? Uh, you know, deciding what I wanted to do when I grow up was basically what helped me decide to go for mayor. <laughs> Looking back on your... way of doing that. Looking back yep. on your time as mayor so far, and I know you only are uh, five years into your mayorship or your mayoral ship, um, would you have changed it? Have you enjoyed your five years as mayor so far? I definitely wouldn't have changed it. Uh, my previous job would have killed me. I, I, I be, can be as blunt as that. I, I've watched many of my colleagues uh, that did the same thing as me in, in that environment uh, fall to heart attacks and other things over the years since I've left. Um Though it has been a heck of a lot of challenges um, from the mill closure to start with uh, having to go out there and be the public eye of that to going toe to toe with provincial cabinet ministers to the point where, you know, people were calling me in the middle of the night saying, you got to back off um, or, you know, you're going to not be able to, to to work with others in, in provincial government um, to 
getting into the depths of COVID to being on the absolute edge of things during some of the worst wildfire seasons in British Columbia um, to what we're going through right now um, in the last few months with COVID, plus the other elephant that has been through um, the room for the entire term is the, the construction of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which turned our town uh, in the middle of a pandemic into a boom town, uh, basically increasing the size of the town by 50% uh, and all the pressures that that brought on to. So there, there has never been a simple week during my mayorship, but I am someone who enjoys what I call herding cats, uh, herding chaos, getting chaos to run in the right direction or all, or all into the same direction. That has always been sort of my skill as a people manager and as, and as a manager of things in the world. You mentioned something that I wasn't going to talk about, but you brought you opened Pandora's box. So I'm going to jump in here for a second. You talk about how you have to sort of ruffle some feathers when it comes to provincial or even federal relationships from a, a municipal standpoint. How important is it to strike that balance of advocating for your town, but not coming off as a uh, as a hard ass, pardon my French, and sort of being that mayor who wants the best for their community but needs to twist some arms and pull some hair when it comes to provincial and federal relations, because I can imagine your community doesn't care that you're being angry at the provincial government. They want the best for their community. For sure. It's a tough one. And it's definitely a style um, and, a, a, and a thing that I've changed my mind on over my term as mayor. Uh, take the forestry example. Um, when our mill closed and there was what was a, called a 10-year transfer to another company um, we were one of the first we were the first town or area where that 10-year transfer was covered under undrip dripa regulations in british columbia so when one logging company was transferring cutting rights to another log logging company that had a mill elsewhere all of that went before first nations and that process essentially ground to an absolute halt the problem with that was for local industry, the local logging truck drivers and the people that were cutting wood in, in the bush, they still needed their jobs. So I, I had this horrible position of being in that I had to recognize that my mill was going to close, but I still had to protect the jobs that were left. left. And, and I had to go to a forest minister that was in no hurry to move and basically tell him to move quite publicly uh, to the point where it caused quite a stir. Um, but I had the ability to do that and, and local first nations who were also negotiating in, as part of this transfer, um, needed benefits as well. And they didn't. So it was not only necessarily speaking up for me, but also helping out others, um, that needed those jobs to continue. And I definitely know I, multi, there's no such thing as free speech. You can, you can say what you want in the world, uh, in Canadian politics, but there's always a cost if you push the line too far. And it's that balance um, that you really have to think about. I'm now working on healthcare issues with the healthcare crisis in BC. Going in hot and heavy into healthcare issues where you have a shortage of doctors and nurses and your, your negative comments and your negative style will stress everybody out is not a positive um, situation to be in or a position to take you need to be creating an environment that people see as helpful or solving versus critical and negative and chaotic. Um, it, that's how my style has definitely evolved over time is deciding what tack to take for what situation. Um, and but sometimes it, chaotic works though. Yeah. Sometimes chaotic works oh, though, for sure. at the end of the day. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's sometimes you definitely have to take a stand and you have to take it loud and, and you need to, you know, to be blunt, piss people off in order to get the attention or to get the reaction or get them to the table to at least tell you what's going on. And, and that's one thing that I definitely noticed over the time uh, with provincial government, especially, is sometimes you need to elicit a reaction to get them to the table um, so that you can at least find out what's going on and assist with the solution to that um, and not be kept in the dark because your citizens want you to know what's going on. They want to actually help solve situations, um, whether it be wildfire and Lytton and, and things like that. It's when government doesn't keep municipal politicians in the loop that quite often problems brew up, especially with the public. 
your residents, I'm assuming if I went to the district of Clearwater tomorrow and I asked 100 people of their top priority, I'm assuming healthcare would tra- probably be in the top five, probably even the top yeah. two issues. Yeah. Healthcare is not a municipal issue, though. Healthcare it's is a not. provincial issue. How do you, as mayor, advocate for issues that are not in the municipal realm? Because most people would assume. I don't care who you are. You're my elected official. You're going to solve my issue for me, and it's health care. So how do you balance that act of we need to work on the town, but the people of my town are saying the biggest issue for the town right now is health care? Yeah, and that I've had that exact same conversation. I actually, we've successfully gone from over 60 days of emergency room closures here in Clearwater over the last summer to zero since last September. Um, and that was from changing my attitude in a lot of senses and advocating very heavily for being part of the solution, providing housing, uh, providing relationships for doctors and nurses. It is not our business as municipalities to be in the healthcare business. We shouldn't be involved in this conversation at all. But, you know, anybody who does this job knows that if you lose your high school, you lose your town. If you lose your hospital, you lose your town. You lose your doctors, you lose your town. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to be in the business of advocating for healthcare. So it's a matter of economic survival. It is a matter of survival of your town. When those things go away, so does your town and, and the resources that go with it. That's why you have to get involved. And especially in the dire situation that the Canadian medical system is in right now, where we have more need than we have people. It's simple supply and demand issue that we have right now in Medicare, but it's also driven by personalities, uh, stress, COVID, and everything else that's causing people to to walk away from this job. So the more your town can get involved in the solution, and and I've, the North Island mayors, um, several other mayors in uh, British Columbia, I formed a a regional um, rural healthcare alliance uh, last fall with some other mayors to to advocate to the province. for rural healthcare issues, but also to let the province know that we were working together as a group and that we weren't going to all be stand alone on this and try to tackle this one-on-one. We were going to come together as a force and demand change um, to get things done here. Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years And to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own, and often on a case-by-case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. Before I go into segment two, I want to preface this question by saying that this is an opinion of the mayor and he's talking to me. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion at council. This is an opinion. (laughs) We get a lot of fan mail saying uh, this person has spoke out a turn because of that. So with that being said, uh, I, I, I think I know what the answer is going to be. But your worship, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue today as of recording facing the District of Clearwater? Climate change. Absolutely no doubt about climate change. We forget how much this affects everything right now. Uh, I can tell you if there's a grant out there right now, it's something to do with a water sewer pipe or a generator that we need for um, protection of of water supplies during a drought, um, air conditioning during another heat dome, something like that. Climate change is affecting basically every decision at some level that we're that we're looking at. Um, First Nations uh, consultation under DRIPA and UNDRIPA, that's a lens you put on everything, um, but it's definitely climate change that is the one that will 
paint every decision we make for the next 10 years. So how is the District of Clearwater and yourself as mayor helping to address that? Because again, climate change is not a municipal issue. It affects municipalities, but it is a federal issue and provincial issue. So how are you as the mayor addressing climate change on a local level? Multiple ways. Uh, For starters, we have a community forest around our town. Clearwater several years ago was rated as the third most likely uh, at risk of wildfire in the entire province of British Columbia because of the forest that surrounds this town. So you you look at a risk like that, you go, what can you do? You partner with the Ministry of Forest, uh, with your community forest that surrounds your town. You say, how do we reduce that risk by reducing fuel? That's one. How do you beef up your water system to ensure that you have fire flow demands within your town to protect as many neighborhoods as you can? How do you beef up your volunteer fire department so that they have the resources like sprinkler systems for homes um, to help fight fires when they come how do you inform your citizens that they need to take care of the areas around their homes locally fire smart programs are what, are what they're called and and keep telling them that you really need to protect yourself because the scale of of what could happen in a wildfire is far beyond the resources of any town to have without partnerships with other areas other towns and, and other regions so it's multi-level. Um, right now we have uh, grants out for large-scale generators so we can protect our well systems in the event of a power failure with BC Hydro, um, but also provide air conditioning and you know refrigeration and things like that for local community members. It's basically every pipe that goes into the ground, every power line we connect to, every facility that we build, we have to add one more thing for climate change or climate change adaptation to the thought process because elsewhere we're seeing instances where that didn't happen and you know even data storage Lytton when Lytton burned they lost all their town data because both of their servers were actually located in town and both of them burned we have to make the decision to have stuff in the cloud versus having it in the buildings here in town to prevent that risk it is so involved and there's so many things you don't think about but we as a community have learned the lessons from other communities and are applying them locally here how often would you say that climate change comes up at a regular council meeting because i can imagine it it's not a a, a phrase that's probably tossed out every council meeting but is there is your yourself and your fellow councillors always thinking about that when it comes to strategic planning the priorities that the council has to set foot because i've i've used to live in a fire zone as well in the boreal forest mm-hmm. up in uh, northern alberta and fire smart was one of those things that it wasn't talked about but there was always someone in the room that always mentioned it and you people went that's right we have to think about this before we continue yeah, I think it's not so much as we say climate change out loud. It's just sort of an automatic now. It's it's more of, okay, so what are the most at-risk things? And it just happens to be a side effect. We're in a resource town. To be quite frank, if I had gone out into the community and said, we need to do climate change protection, we need to do all the things for the sake of global warming and em- emissions reductions and that sort of thing, I, I probably wouldn't be in the mayor's chair. But it, if I sell them uh, for completely valid reasons as ways to protect this community, the, the benefit is actually is protecting this community. People accept them. People go, you know, I don't believe in climate change, but, you know, we've had a couple hot summers. So that generator to power the well, so we have the fire flow to protect my house, I can buy into that. Okay. Um so it's about that, messaging. That's basically how it goes. Yeah, for sure. It, it is, absolutely. I mean, I do a lot of work um, with other governments. I now teach um, uh, social and traditional media courses to other local elected officials um, because it is all about messaging. And that is also part of my background is, is as a writer and a former person that um, I did five years in radio and broadcasting. So Messaging, I think, is key. Clear messaging to your community and to the greater world is essential on on issues like this and deciding what the message is. It's not always black and white. There's different ways to sell different things. You you talk about your uh, most 
important issue that you believe is facing the District of Clearwater. But again, if I go back to your uh, district and I talk to 100 people, they will all have mm -hmm. their own personal issue that they believe is the most important, whether it be a pothole, sidewalk, park upgrade. How do you balance that as mayor? How do you balance the issues that are facing your community versus the issues that are facing the individual? Because you're there to move the district forward. And yes, you can't forget the people who've elected you, but you also have to remember that this, the district has to move forward while yeah. moving forward your individual issues. Yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> I've had... Le <laughs> I've had people come up to me uh, prior to the election and and tell me you know all sorts of things about how wonderful I am, but I'm not going to vote for you because you never fixed the pothole in front of my house. Uh, Clear, Clearwater as a new municipality has more roads per kilometer uh, per person than than any other town our size in British Columbia. It's a constant battle to look at those infrastructure things. So it's about quite often planning to do climate change stuff at the same time, well, how can we get a benefit to fixing roads out of that? If you're going to dig up pipes, can we repave that lane? It's working together to look at the grants that can benefit both of those things to make those priorities mesh. And that's how you take care of uh, growth issues. Our town continues to grow. Uh, right now, uh, while well, the rest of Canada is, is talking about a housing crisis on a daily basis, um, we, I believe, have between 120 and 200 uh, subdivision lots in the process right now for new home development in a town that has 100 or 1,100 homes right now. So we're, we're probably looking at the largest home growth spurt in, in the history of our town ever since, since pre-incorporation, since it basically showed up on the map uh, 80 wow. years ago. So those growing pains are driving a lot of these things. How do you get the added benefit of prepping yourself? How do you oversize those pipes to anticipate for future growth, but also fire flow protection, um, the need for sewer? How do you increase those power lines for future air conditioning, not just what we currently think we need? How do you look at communications and, and, and double and triple up protection on communications so that when you do hit a disaster, you don't lose things to landslides, floods, fire, et cetera. Um, all of those lenses, do you do a little bit more um, just because you know that we're probably headed to harder times and hotter times down the road? How do you balance growth versus the, I want my town to feel the same way as I moved in 5, 10, 15 years ago? Because growth is important, but also keeping that small town feel that residents have come to know and love is probably balancing out of how much growth do we actually want in our community? For sure. I mean, there's a lot of people that would like things to stay the same. Uh, we, we, got, we had a major supermarket uh, chain build in town versus the little country supermarket that had been here uh since the early 70s and there were a lot of people a year and a half into that uh new supermarket that said i want to go back to that uh, smaller cramped but more human supermarket fond memories of the 50s I, as i like to say you know the times past that that's there for everybody i get that nostalgia of town that said i think small town happiness is a state of mind um, it's not necessarily about the number of people that you have in town, but it's about the things that you can do here. And one thing, post-incorporation via pre-incorporation, we do so much here. We have a transit system. We do seniors programming. We have such a massively active senior society in town. Uh, we do fitness programs. Um, we do sports programs. We have a... Uh, trails task force that has uh, built dozens of kilometers of walking trails within town. Um, so many things like that. Uh, there's uh, there's probably more people, more heads involved in volunteering in Clearwater. If you if you take those heads and put multiple hats on them, then there are actually people involved in Clearwater. Clearwater punches well above its weight because of volunteerism and, and what volunteerism and community involvement can do. And a lot of that is created on the seeds of both local government and community clubs working together. So that sort of love where you live um, ethos that we have in Clearwater is 
comes about because of those partnerships between local government, the grants we can access, access things like a community forest, and then those service groups coming together. So I think we have more because of growth and because of incorporation than we really did before that. Um, and I think that when people see that success and realize that it's okay to have some growth in this town, that if we get to 3,000 or 5,000, then we can start talking about a pool, um, that we can start talking about adding more things to better life in town than we have right now. That's when people get accepting of growth. I want to turn to our last segment now, and that is my favorite one, because as a tourist, I'd like to visit communities and see <laughs> firsthand what the elected leaders say I should go do. So uh, you're a mayor. <laughs> I was going to call you your worship there, but Mayor Blackwell. Yep. Um, if I was a tourist, say potentially in June, coming through the district of Clearwater, which I've planned already, uh, what should mm -hmm. I stop and see? Oh, well, so Clearwater is known uh, marketing wise as the gateway to Wells Gray Park. So up the, up the road here is 5,000 kilometers of the most stunning wilderness in, in Canada. Uh, 39 named waterfalls, including Helmican Falls, which is absolutely spectacular. I worked there from uh, my 19th birthday until uh, basically three and a half years ago. Um, so my life, I spent more time in that park than anyone alive at this particular moment in history. Uh, and it is a spectacular place. We have some of the best white water rafting here in town. We have flower meadows. If you come in June, you're going to see bears on the side of the road. Uh, you're going to see all sorts of wildflowers. It's a spectacular natural place. And I spent a lot of my time talking to foreign tourists, especially the Germans and that sort of thing. They go through the BAMP, they go through the Jasper. They Those places are spectacular. I've visited them all myself, mostly out of curiosity to compare the Wells Gray experience to them. Um, but uh, what Wells Gray has is a, a natural, unspoiled, non-overused beauty um, that you really can't find in those Rocky Mountain things. It's not as spectacular in the, the tall mountains and things like that. But in Wells Gray, it's quite common that you can go hiking out on a trail for an hour and not come across another person, that you can go into a flower mo meadow that is straight out of the sound of music, and you may see 20 people in your two to three hours there, if that, if at all. Um, you can see bears walking on the side of the road, uh, but it's not paved. Um, you can pick berries off the side of the trail. You can see all of these things. So you go on a whitewater rafting trip, within a provincial park where you're not going to see a power line your entire trip, let alone a house or any other side of, of human activity. There's an unspoiled nature here that's not crowded, um, that people return year after year to, and not just from BC, but from other countries. They come after, back year after year to experience this. That's what's so special about Clearwater and the Wells Bay area. Well, as uh, we as we have listeners, uh, surprisingly, in Germany and in Ireland, I would highly recommend yep. them stop in uh, the District of Clearwater for that. But what about yourself, though? After a stressful day, after a stressful day at council or a stressful day of just being mayor, where do you go in the district to just decompress and relax? And you can't say your house because a lot of councillors and mayors are saying <laughs> that to me. <laughs> no, I, I'm going to say that I actually uh, de-stress in the morning. So one of my ways of keeping in touch with this community is I go have coffee at, um, at the local chain coffee branch. And it used to be the non-chain coffee branch and, and, and things like that in town. So pick your local coffee spot. And I have what I call old man coffee with the guys that are 20 years older than me. And it, it's, those are the best conversations. I'm sorry. They <laughs> are. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, so my, my side hobbies, one of my side hobbies is fixing vintage Japanese cars. So I can sit down at a table with a couple of mechanics, discuss issues that I'm having with what I'm doing. Um, but I also get a really good feel on what people are thinking about the community right now. Um, I don't, let them know that all the time, but I am listening to the conversations that are happening around me about on, you know, seniors, on housing, on, you know, um, medical issues, on the prices at the grocery store and the gas pump, all of those things that are, you know, of concern to people I get from having those morning conversations with people. And, and these people, these old guys and old gals and young guys and young gals that come up and talk to me, 
they now forget that they're informing me. It, it's it's very it's not obvious the way it used to be when somebody came up to me and said, I, I need to talk to you about something. It's just the casual conversation that keeps me rooted in the community. And I and I do that on a couple of different fronts. I, I purposely put myself into various coffee shops and into various places to listen to people's conversations. Um, I, I take a little extra time at the at the package store picking up my packages to listen to the people at the front counter there just to know what I should be paying to attention to in this town. Because when you do become mayor, sometimes there's this standoffish niche that that happens. I'm just a normal guy. Uh, I've always tried to just be a normal guy. Um, so I always try to just put myself in situations where I can listen. I, I think it's probably the best thing to say. Do you get more information out of those coffee chats or those meetings at the post office than say, if you're getting approached by people or even social media, because I've never asked someone that, but it, you, you mentioned it. So I just want to see if what your opinion on yeah. that is. Yeah, I I do a lot of social media. Um, I I was a mayor that you, was you commenting. do <laughs> your Twitter. I is do, active. I do. Yeah, no, no, I I do Twitter fearlessly. Um, I do. I until a year ago, I did Facebook fear, fearlessly. I had no problem answering citizens um, in real time on social media platforms. Um, I you know I'm also probably one of the most interviewed small town mayors in Canada, and that's. A couple of opinions from reporters and i think that's kind of funny um i enjoy that um but i do definitely get the best opinions on my town from the cashiers at the supermarket from those people they really do feed me their concerns but they also understand that i'm going to take those conversations away in confidentiality and filter them in a way that i can bring them back to the decision table without exposing them as the people that gave them to me. Um, right now we're dealing with some fairly horrendous issues to do with animal welfare in town. And a lot of people are coming to me and informing to me about bad situations that involve the SBCA and things like that in our town. But they're very fear fearful that they're gonna be the people that have told the mayor what's going on because it's such a small town. I call it one degree of separation, one degree of Kevin Bacon. You know everybody in this town through at least one person. You have to protect the confidentiality of your citizens when you when you work in a town that, that's this small, but you still have to find a way while protecting that confidentiality to use what they tell you to solve problems. And that I think is probably one of the biggest roles as a small town mayor is maintaining that trust that you will look after both sides of the equation, protection of citizens, but still solve the problems. My last question, because I, I just uh, cautious of time here for your, uh, for yourself, mayor, but um, yeah. what makes the district of Clearwater such a unique place? Um, I think in some ways, because it is so young, we don't have a history that guides us the way that a lot of uh, older 100-year-old, 200-year-old towns have. Um, we can basically create ourselves as we want, as we move along, because there are no rules. There, you know, There's some local history. There's some, some ways that things have always been done. But we can really break free of those with new ideas. Um, a lot of the programs and, and things that exist here we just did because we didn't know any better. Uh, creating um, um, health and fitness programs. Oh no, you, a town your size can't have those. You don't have enough uh, infrastructure or tax resources to do that. Well, we didn't know that. We just did it um, for the betterment of the community. And and there are no sacred cows in Clearwater. There are no heritage buildings. There are no things that can't be remade if we can find a way to make it better. And I think that and the will to do that with the citizens to create a new community, um, a bigger, better, happier, funner, uh, more interesting, great place for people to work. Um, we, we attract so many people because we fit a checklist of what people want when they're looking to move out of a larger city. Um, and we, we've purposely gone to that good internet access to uh, an airport within an hour's drive in a major city within about an hour, hour and a half drive. Um, excellent recreation programs inside and outside town. Um, 
a hospital, a full staff, almost a full staff of doctors in a time of healthcare crisis. When people do the checklist of where they want to live, quite often they end up on Clearwater without actually arriving in Clearwater to check it out, uh, which is what I find very interesting. And that is quite intentional at this point to protect all of those things that would put in people's mind, this is a great small town to live in. Um, so that they, they do want to come here, but they also want to come here with their self-employment or their businesses or whatever they want in life um, so that we don't become just a retirement town, which is a, it's a whole other conversation on how you manage that sort of thing. We create an environment to create a, a wonderful place to live, and, and that's always been a goal of current government since incorporation in Clearwater. Well, uh, Mayor Blackwell, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and talking to me for the last 45 minutes. This has been an honor to have you on the show. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to coming out and visiting the District of Clearwater this summer. So I'm looking forward to possibly seeing you at one of those local coffee shops early in the morning. <laughs> yep. Just just look for the, the green old car that you don't recognize, and I'll give you a ride in something that you've uh, you've never seen before so uh yeah i'll, I'll be out there if, uh, just to ask anybody they'll point me out <laughs> perfect so with that i want to remind everyone put down social media go have a conversation with somebody it helps our society helps our democracy and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day so this has been the cross-border interviews with chris brown have yourself an excellent day and remember everyone keep talking <laughs>